Okay, so the research of an unannounced neo-Ottoman policy has in recent times come to the forefront of academic and media analysis in understanding the justice and development piece um, foreign policy, and obviously this political party is which uh, the current Turkish president Erdogan you know, belongs to. So this presentation will not uh, revolve around the conditions which allowed uh, for neo-Ottomanism to emerge, which is primarily, you know, it comes from the frustrations of Turkey not being able to ascend into the European Union. But rather, uh, this presentation will explore the unofficial policy uh, being put into practice in Syria. Because of the specific scope, the presentation will focus primarily on neo-Ottomanism as a tool for Turkish hard power, um, and also its imperial ambitions. Uh, when understanding neo-Ottomanism as a policy primarily based on hard policy, or hard power, it allows one to explore Turkey's growing influence, foreign policy and imperialism through this very specific scope. So first we must understand what the Ottoman Empire was and what neo-Ottomanism uh, is. It does not discriminate in culture or geography, and rather it incorporates all former areas of the Ottoman Empire that stretch from the Caucasus to the Horn of Africa, from North Africa to the Middle East, uh, the majority of the Balkans and parts of uh, Central Europe for a very short period of time. What I contend is that this modern policy adopted by Erdogan and the AKP, his political party that he belongs to, it extends outside of the borders of the Ottoman Empire and is a means to project Turkish influence into, Turkic, uh, into the Turkic world, which is primarily Central Asia. Um, and, you know, even though Central Asia wasn't a part of the Ottoman Empire, it, it, um, you know, and it's detached from Turkey, it's still sort of relevant to each other. However, you know, quite obviously, I'm obviously focusing on neo-Ottomanism in Syria. And as a theoretical base for Turkish imperialism, in which through nostalgia of a time of when the Turkish people as a whole collective were a great power. This is the very source of um, the inspiration of Erdogan's foreign policy and his interventions in not only Syria, but places like Iraq. So what was the Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Empire was a multinational, multilingual empire, which as I said earlier, incorporates parts of the Balkans, uh, Central Europe, um, Africa, the Caucasus, uh, the Caucasus, the Middle East, and Anatolia. And it has its uh, roots beginning in 1929. So the Ottoman Empire saw the Turkish people being a major power for many centuries, peaking in 1566 under the rule of Solomon uh, the Magnificent. The empire collapsed and what emerged was the Turkish Republic in 1923. However, I'll skip back a few years uh, from 1923, however, and I'll move on to 1915, the midst of World War I. And 1915 saw the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire. And what we saw was um, the, the, the remnants of, of the Ottoman Empire engaging, engaging in mass extermination of its minorities to create a new homogenous uh, Turkish state. So this saw 750,000 Anatolian and Pontic Greeks exterminated. Um, it saw 300,000 Assyrians exterminated. It saw 1.5 million Armenians exterminated. Um, all by Turkish authorities, as well as uh, certain Kurdish tribes as well. So what we saw was that the surviving Greeks, or, or the refugee Greeks, they ended up in, in the state that we call Greece. Um, however, where did most of the surviving Armenians and Assyrians end up? In Syri uh, Assyrians, my apologies. They all ended up in Syria, or the vast majority ended up in Syria. Now why the Armenian and Assyrian minorities in Syria is important and how it shapes Turkish foreign policy is something that I'll explore just a little bit later on. Um, but it's very, very crucial to our understanding of uh, Turkish, uh, Turkey's involvement in Syria. So with the weakened Turkey, it has never been able to replicate the former glory that was the Ottoman Empire. Although an important regional player, especially on the crossroads uh, between Europe and Asia, and being a NATO member in the midst of the Cold War, where obviously it was aligned with the United States to um, uh, counteract the Soviet Union, as it was right on its uh, very borders, it has never been a great power, as I just said, ever, um, since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Although Turkey illegally um, incorporated the Syrian province of Iskenderun, or what we now know today as Hatay province, in, in a very small little uh, portion of, of Turkey, um, it incorporated it into the Turkish Republic in 1939. And <coughs> Turkey also illegally invaded and has occupied northern Cyprus since 1974. 
These are very minuscule attempts of uh, replicating the Ottoman Empire, but you know, nonetheless, uh, very, very aggressive. Uh, for the majority of the existence of the Turkish Republic, it has been guided by the principles of its founding father, Kemal Ataturk, with the theory known as Kemalism. Now, uh, Kemalism uh, was the changing of this political, social, cultural and religious order in Turkey, and designed to separate the new Turkish state from its Ottoman predecessor. Kemalism also embraced uh, westernized ways of living, so they adopted things such as uh, democracy, secularism and, and whatnot, you know, all those principles that, that Western Europe holds so dearly. Because of the adoption of Kemalism, which embraces a westernized way of living, Turkey began its application to join the European Union in 1987. However, as it currently occupies uh, the northern portion of the island of Cyprus, in which the, re the remainder of the island uh, constitutes the Republic um, of Cyprus, which is also a European Union member, it has continuously had its accession into the EU in limbo as negotiations continue. Now, why is this important? It is this very frustration of Turkey not being able to join the EU that saw its uh, foreign policy shift from the west to the east. And what I mean by the east is quite obviously uh, the Middle East. So the AKP, uh, the political party that Erdogan belongs to, it portrayed itself when it was established in 2001 as being extremely pro-Western and pro-American, however still very, very conservative. So it had an Islamist element to it. Now... Um, it quickly began to evolve, uh, involve itself in the meddling of its eastern neighbours. So, before um, uh, Erdogan, it was very, Turkey was very, very westward looking. Now Erdogan comes in and all of a sudden he wants to meddle in everybody's affairs. Now, most significantly was the emergence uh, with, with the rise of Erdogan and his party. It was the emergence of uh, Ottoman nostalgia that was sidelined in Turkey because of Kemalism. And as I've already emphasized, Kemalism was very westward uh, looking. So, in the photo, we can see President Erdogan walking between men clad in Ottoman military uniforms of different periods of the empire. Uh, you know, this demonstrates the shift of western influence thinking to a uh, nostalgia of the Ottoman Empire. However, some of these men clad weren't just Ottoman soldiers, but other Turkic uh, soldiers, such as the Seljuks and, and and other Turkic tribes. As a result of this nostalgia, it has meant that the Syrian war has provided an opportunity for Erdogan to attempt to weaken its neighbour and annex territory it believes should be incorporated into the modern Turkish state. As the cases of Syria and Iraq presents, Ankara is willing to take military actions in conflicts that Turkey is not involved in, but also help to foster the very problems that, that are in these countries today. In Syria, Turkey provided aims, uh, sorry, uh, aid, arms, and a safe haven for anti-government forces. Whilst in both Syria and Iraq, it engaged in illegal oil trade with ISIS. I mean, that can't even be denied today. With the decline of anti-government forces in Syria, or otherwise terrorist forces, um, and the rise in northern Syria of the People's Protection Units Militia, otherwise uh, more commonly known as the YPG, which is the Syrian branch of the outlawed Turkey-based Kurdistan Workers' Party. So it's a left-leaning uh, Kurdish uh, militia group that seeks um, autonomy. Um, because of the rise of the YPG in northern Syria, uh, its rise threatens to create an autonomous or independent Kurdish state in Syria that can serve as the basis or justification of an autonomous or independent Kurdish state in eastern Turkey. I'm sure this crowd has mostly heard about uh, the Kurds in, in Eastern Turkey and their decades-long struggle for autonomy, independence, however you want to term it, and it changes time to time. Um, this, is a, this is especially uh, sets a dangerous precedent, um, just as uh, Madame Sulzli will emphasise in her uh, presentation tonight. Um, the Kurds constitute a minority in the majority of the areas they claim for independence. She already brushed upon this in, in the last session. Um, in some places that they claim as being Kurdistan in northern Syria, they even have as little as 0%, and yet they still claim these areas. Now, a Kurdish push for independence in northern Syria not only threatens Turkey's desire to illegally annex this region, but also to destabilize Turkey as the Kurds can make a greater push 
for independence in Eastern Anatolia, or what we can term as today as the eastern portions of Turkey. The threat of an illegal Kurdish state uh, within sovereign Syrian territory provides one of two reasons why the Turkish military with the Free Syrian Army and Islamist jihadist groups launched the Euphrates Shield operation. Now, uh, the above map shows Syria as it was on the 24th of August in 2016, when Turkey began its illegal intervention in northern Syria. As we can see in the black or the grey, um, ISIS held onto a stretch of the border with Turkey, uh, with the Kurdish forces in yellow in the east pushing <laughs> westwards towards the other yellow enclave known as Afrin. The green is a Turkish backed Islamist. I apologise for the map, it says rebels, which doesn't do it any justification for their true intentions and their true ideology. Now, the purpose of the Euphrates Shield uh, operation was to ensure that the two Kurdish areas did not connect and to fight ISIS and the YPG, in which Turkey recognises now as both being terrorist groups. <coughs> now, I'll show you a map of the current situation in northern Syria. <coughs> this is now the current situation in northern Syria where ISIS have been expelled from the border region with Turkey. Um, from the, Euph uh, from the Euphrates shield operation. So the two Kurdish held regions are blocked from being able to, con uh, to connect to each other by the Turkish led forces and the Syrian army. So it's almost impossible for the Kurds now to connect unless they want a very serious war with um, Turkey or, or the Syrian government. Now the Euphrates shield operation officially ended just a few weeks ago on the 29th of March. Although the operation may be seen to be good, as it uh, contracted the areas that ISIS has, uh, you know, has control over and prevented a unified Kurdish region that pushed for independence or federalization, it has its own sinister ambitions. There's no denial about that. Now, immediately after the Turkish-led forces took the border of Jarablus, which we can just see up on, on the corner of the yellow and the green areas of control, um, as soon as the Turkish-led forces took control of this town from ISIS, Photos emerged from the supposed liberated settlement that was littered with Turkish flags, um, portraits of the current uh, President Erdogan, <coughs> and of the founding father of Turkey, which I noted earlier was Ataturk. As we can see on the top left photo, we have the Free Syrian Army flag side by side with Erdogan and the Turkish flag. We must question why portraits of a foreign president are being erected on, on the land of a sovereign country. On the bottom left, we can see this government uh, building in Jarablus. So this is in sovereign Syria. It has written on the top of it, Kerablus. Now this is the Turkish name for, for the town. So we must question, why, why are government buildings having the names of, of a foreign language written on it, rather than its own native language? Um, on the right, we see inside another government building of Jarablus, uh, the portrait of Ataturk, the founding father of Turkey, and obviously the Turkish flag. So, you know, in this supposed liberated area of Syria, thanks to Turkey and its backed militants, all of a sudden we got flags of Turkey, the current president, the founding father, etc. Now, I contend that Neo-Ottomanism is the primary motivation for Turkey's illegal intervention in Syria. Especially when one considers Turkish state institutions publishing maps of Greater Turkey incorporating areas of northern Syria, northern Iraq, uh, parts of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Greece and Bulgaria. This is actually a map that's, that's being widely distributed in, in Turkey at the moment. So although Turkey will not be annexing parts of Syria anytime soon, it is this combination of irredentist cartography and, and rhetoric that offers some insight into Turkey's current foreign policy and domestic policies and Ankara's self-image. The maps in particular reveal the continued relevance of Turkish nationalism, a re uh, rise of neo-Ottomanism, a long-standing element uh, of the country's statecraft, now reinvigorated with some revived uh, history and a huge added dose of, of uh, Islamism. You know, Muslim Brotherhood aligned as, as previous speakers um, spoke about today. Now this map shows the border laid out in Turkey's National Pact, a document Erdogan recently suggested the Prime Minister of Iraq should read to understand his country's illegal stationing of troops near Mosul. So he produces a document as a justification why uh, he can put his military into a sovereign country without any coordination from, uh, the, from the politicians of uh, Iraq. 
This also applies directly to Syria. Now, this document was signed in 1920, after the Ottoman Empire's defeat in World War I. The National Pact identified those parts of the empire that the government was prepared to fight for. Specifically, it claimed those territories that were still held by the Ottoman army in October 1918, when Constantinople, its former capital city, uh, before it moved to Ankara, uh, signed an armistice uh, with the Allied powers. On Turkey's southern border, this line ran from just north of Aleppo, in what is now, you know, today's Syria's largest city and, and only a few months ago liberated, um, right across into Kurdkut, Kurd, uh, which we uh, see in today's northern Iraq. Turkey's official history has praised Ataturk for essentially realising the borders envi uh, envisioned by the National Pact minus, you know, parts of northern Syria and Iraq, I mean, Azerbaijan, Bulgaria, Greece, but it's still very minuscule. He managed to achieve a very significant state out of Turk. Now, Erdogan, by contrast, has given voice to an alternative narrative in which Ataturk's willingness in the Treaty of Lausanne at the end of World War I uh, to abandon territories such as northern Syria and Iraq was not an act of eminent pragmatism, but rather a betrayal. This suggestion, against all evidence, is that a better statesman, or perhaps a more patriotic one, could have gotten more land for the newly founded Turkish Republic. <coughs> so, Erdogan is very, very disappointed in the founding father of Turkey that most Turks adore, despite his involvement in a very brutal um, genocide. <coughs> a decade ago, Erdogan's enthusiasm for all things Ottoman appeared to be part of an effective strategy for improving relations with the Muslim Middle East, a policy that some critics in the United States saw as a challenge to their own uh, country's um, position or influence in the Middle East. By refashioning the National Pact as a justification for irredentism, <coughs> my apologies, rather than a rebuke of it has not been popular among Turkey's neighbours, most primarily obviously Syria and Iraq. In Syria and Iraq, Erdogan is aiming to achieve a long-standing uh, national goal, that being the defeat of the Kurdistan Workers' Party that I mentioned earlier, or which can also be abbreviated as the PKK, by building on the traditional nationalist tools of Turkish foreign policy, namely the leveraging of Turkish minorities in neighbouring countries. The Turkmen of Syria, for example, they number approximately about one million people. It's a little bit hard to tell because there hasn't been a census done in Syria for, for a very, very long time. So we go on to the Sultan Murad Brigade. Uh, comprising predominantly by ethnic Turkmens, has been one of Ankara's military assets inside Syria against both the Syrian government and the PKK. So this is a faction of the Free Syrian Army made up entirely of uh, Turkmen, or, you know, that we can also call as Turks. Named after Ottoman Sultan Murad II, so this whole brigade is named after a former Ottoman Sultan, the flag of the Sultan Murad uh, division quotes the Shahada to express a political commitment to political Islam, while the red symbolizes Turkish nationalism. Uh, this is a fusioning in the core ideology of neo-Ottomanism. So it's a mixture of conservative Islam and obviously Turkish nationalism. Meanwhile, the Turkmen population living around Mosul and its surrounding area has been a concern and an asset for Ankara in Iraq, supposedly. Supposedly, Turkey is very concerned about them, but rather, you know, we'll see that they're just trying to use them for their own sort of expansion policies. So, Turkish special forces have worked with the Iraqi Turkmen Front, um, a Turkmen militia group in Iraq, since at least 2003, which is obviously when the US invaded uh, the country. And this was in order to expand Turkish influence and counter the PKK in northern Iraq. However, the Syrian war also provides Turkey the opportunity to continue its extermination policy of the Armenians that had begun over 100 years ago. In the early hours of the 21st of March 2014, the Armenian town of Kesar and its surrounding vill uh, villages in Latakia's countryside near the Turkish border, or right on the Turkish border, saw a multi-pronged attack by forces opposed to the Syrian government. The attackers who were members of the terrorist groups Al Nusra. Um, Sham al Islam, um, Anza al Sham, they advanced directly from, Turkish, uh, from the Turkish border, um, from Turkish uh, territory, I should say, and they were being supported by the Turkish military, and injured militant fighters were being sent to medical centers in Turkey once they were injured. So we can see a direct support to these terrorist groups. 
Mehmet Ali Edipoglu, he was the MP of the Turkish CHP party, the opposition party in Turkey. He visited the area several days after the attack began, and he said that villagers on the Turkish side of the border told him that thousands of fighters, quote unquote, thousands of fighters coming from Turkey crossed the border from at least five different points to launch the attack on the Armenian town of Kesab. Now, Kesab was an Armenian village where most of the survivors, or not most, but uh, most of the inhabitants of this town are descendants of Armenian genocide uh, survivors. Now, Armenia's Minister of Diaspora, Kranush Hakobian, uh, said that in Kesab, Armenian churches had been defaced, crosses on the churches had been removed, and property were looted. Also on the 3rd of April, Ruben Melkonian, uh, the Deputy Dean of the Oriental Studies at Yerevan State University, said that the Armenian uh, community in Kesab was unlikely to recover and that what had happened were, quote unquote, crimes that make a genocide. This again is explained by Neo-Ottomanism as it is in the hope to drive out uh, the Armenian population of the region and bring in Turkmen settlers and provide a justification to annex this region to join the Turkish Republic. However, with, the, uh, with Turkey's referendum only two days ago that sought to bring the president greater powers in the country, how neo-Ottomanism uh, will accelerate remains to be seen. Naturally, Syria's largest terrorist groups, Jaish al-Islam and Akra al-Sham, have already congratulated Erdogan for his victory in the referendum. The tweets on the left comes from their official spokesman. Um, on the right is, is an official statement from, from the groups, and they use the Free Syrian Army uh, sort of um, logos to start, uh, kind of cover it up. And then obviously we got pro Erdogan supporters that are pushing for the yes vote for the referendum that just happened two days ago. Now, the changes to the constitution, which this referendum was about, what's changed in Turkey? The president will have a five-year tenor for a maximum of two years. So in the next elections, he can, Erdogan can again go for the presidency for another further two terms if the Turkish people decide they want to vote him in again. Uh, the second point, the president will be able to directly appoint top officials, including ministers and one or several vice presidents. So he can choose his own ministers and vice presidents while beforehand he didn't have such power. Uh, the job of the prime minister will be scrapped, gone, the president will have power to intervene in the judiciary. That's very, very significant. Who knows what kind of things can happen with that? I guess time will tell. The, the referendum only passed two days ago. The president will decide whether or not to impose a state of emergency. This effectively has made Erdogan into an almost sultan-like figure as he will now become increasingly authoritarian and with the terrorist groups congratulating the dictator-like president suggests that he will continue to intervene in Syria and continue his support for the bloodshed that's occurring in Syria. Turkey's current interventionism in Syria and Iraq fits with a very, very established pattern. This pattern has continued time and time again. Not only do countries regularly find themselves sucked into wars on their doorstep, but the points at which Turkey has proved susceptible to irredentism is the part, uh, in the past have all come at moments of change and uncertainty. Now what do I mean by that? In 1939, Ankara annexed the province of what it calls today Hatay, or known as Iskenderun, then under French control by taking advantage of the crisis in Europe on the eve of World War II. So it took this uh, province that should be Syrian in 1939, with the problems of World War II emerging. Then after the war, Syria's newfound independence prompted some in the Turkish media to cast a glance at Aleppo. And the transfer of the Dodecanese Islands from Italy to Greece also piqued some interest in acquiring them uh, for Turkey. So the Dodecanese Islands are uh, a Greek island group right on the border um, with uh, Turkey's Mediterranean uh, shoreline. But when, um, similarly, Ankara paid little attention to Cyprus when it was firmly under British control, but when talk of the island's independence began, Turkey started to show its uh, concern. Subsequently, it was only when it appeared that Greece might annex the island that Turkey invaded um, to prevent this change in the status quo. In this light, Turkey's recent rhetoric is perhaps less surprising following several years or decades in which events and commentators have repeatedly suggested that the entire political order of the modern Middle East is supposedly crumbling. So supposedly Syria is crumbling, we know it will bounce back. 
Iraq has unfortunately crumbled. Even if we look at the wider region or the Arab world, Libya has unfortunately crumbled. It is in Turkey's hope, driven by the theory of neo-Ottomanism, that Erdogan hopes to annex regions in what he perceives to be part of, of, of a greater Turkey. Thank you.